Good morning. Welcome to our multi-platform worship service. I am Shay Dively, the intern minister, and I use she, her pronouns, and it is my honor to be co-leading our service today, together with Rita Fitzgerald, our worship associate, Elizabeth Ann, our director of religious exploration education, and Holly Ferris, our music director. Thank you to Holly and Restoration Singers for providing music, and of course to Mike Foy for running our AV Tech today. A few small announcements before we begin. If you could please silence any cell phones, um, we would appreciate it. So we want to be as present as possible in this space. Restrooms are located in the rear of the sanctuary if you haven't been here before, and they're down the stairs to the right, or you can take the mechanical lift to the left. An usher can help you navigate anything if you are new to the space. We are streaming live, and if you're joining us online, you can choose to toggle on the closed captions by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Child care is available for infants and toddlers, and older children are invited to attend the Religious Education Exploration Group following the story for all ages time. Parents and guardians can pick up kids over in Hale Hall after the service. Let's take a breath together. This is a UU congregation, which means we are people of many differences, different faith traditions, different racial identities, different gender expressions, and of all different ways of moving in and showing up in the world. And we are people of who make covenant promises to act together with love for transformation and healing. We meet in a universalist sanctuary, which means that everyone is included in our beautiful tapestry of divine and diverse love. And we know that we are made more whole by your choice to add your presence today. We've been waiting for you to bring all of who your beautiful self is, and we honor that gift. We are building UU Mount Airy into a beloved community by embracing all souls and nurturing wholeness. And we are in the process of becoming more whole thanks to each of you and your presence here. And for that, we are truly grateful. May this be the place where you come to be your whole self. May this loving community help you to speak your doubts and welcome your questions. May you find transformation and healing. May you leave this place changed for the better, and may you change this place, leaving it better. May our gratitude and these intentions be guiding lights for us this morning. Today's service is about how the season of light calls to us inviting us to honor our Abrahamic ancestors and to hear their voices and stories of wonder and awe from time immemorial, and how their hope can help us brighten our now and our future. Come, let us enter into this sacred and hallowed time and worship together. Today is the second Sunday in Advent, and we honor our Christian roots by lighting the candles of the Advent wreath. I would like to invite Rita up to the chancel to light the two Advent candles for today. As Reverend Rosemary Morrison writes, the second candle of the Advent wreath represents peace. In this time of expectancy and celebration, let us hold on to the ideal of peace. Even though wars rage around the world, and sometimes in our hearts we recognize that peace arrives gently to an open heart, we light the candle of peace to remind us that it is with the softness of a dove's wing that peace descends upon us. We light the candle of peace. Peace can be so hard. 
Yeah, it's true. <laughs> On this holy day, we honor our Jewish roots by lighting the menorah candle. You doing okay, Rita? Yes. Okay. Today is the fourth day of Hanukkah, and as we recite the words of Amanda Yudis Kessler's responsive reading, each candle a miracle, Rita will light the four menorah candles. The words of this reading will be shared to your screen or displayed behind me, and we invite you to read aloud the enlarged, bolded parts. Mike said, wait a minute. We can begin. We light the Hanukkah candles in wonder, joy, and gratitude. Each candle a miracle. When the holy temple was rededicated at the time of the Maccabean liberation battle, only one day's worth of oil remained. Yet it burned for eight days, so we light candles in remembrance. to the miracle of trust in a time of anxiety, to the miracle of faith in a time of cynicism, to the miracle of courage in a time of fear. to the miracle of peace in a time of violence, Rita will now come up and read our chalice lighting. In UU congregations, we light a chalice to celebrate our coming together in love to mark the sacred space and time of our community and invite the spirit into our lives. We invite you to light a candle wherever you are today. Please read along with me if you feel moved to do so as we light our chalice with words from a prayer by Reverend Laura Horton Ludwig called The Imprint of Love. and without, mystery from which we have all emerged, within which we live and die. At times we may fear that love will not be strong enough. At times we may question whether love really is at the root of all things. This is the mystery within which we live and die. These are the questions that haunt our days and nights. And yet, we are not without hope. Our struggles and our questions testify to our longing. Okay. Our opening hymn is Rock of Ages, Let Our Song. We invite you to remain seated as Holly leads us. Let us.
part of our being a community is learning to share the authentic and vulnerable parts of ourselves with others. To see and be seen, to know and be known. We make space today for that sharing, all of which helps us to build this congregation into beloved community. We invite you to share what's going on in your life, to name your feelings and the people on your heart in need of prayer, good energy, best wishes, and other help. We invite you to get into your body and investigate what emotions you're experiencing, to share them as you feel called so we can help one another to hold our joys, our grief, our in-between feelings. We build community by celebrating our good things, mourning our troubles, taking risks, and listening deeply. For our online sharing, we invite you who are on Zoom to share what you're feeling this week and to lift up the names of those about whom you are thinking in the chat. For those watching us on live stream or after Sunday morning, you can reach Reverend McKinley via email at minister at uumountairy.org. And for those in our sanctuary, we ask that you come up one at a time by the side aisle to pick up a stone or stones from the basket, infuse or charge it with your joy or sorrow, and place it in the bowl of water where its energy will ripple out to be held by all of us. Before I invite everybody up, I would like to share with you a deep sadness one of our dearly beloved community members and one who was also important to the larger community, the larger UUA, passed away on Friday. Julie Bradbird is now an ancestor and we will miss her dearly. May she rest in peace and power. Also, I'm going to give the microphone to Holly because she would like to share with us. Friends, um, it's so good to be back. Um, had a rough fall. <laughs> so prayers of gratitude for this community, for many of you, for my wonderful choir, for those who took over and led the music. I watched online from my COVID bed. <laughs> um, so that's a joy. I like to start with joy. Uh, this has been a rough couple of weeks, and I wanted to share with you to hold in prayer my family, my own broken heart, my dear, dear aunt, my favorite aunt, Auntie Barbara, passed suddenly last Saturday. She was 92 and vibrant and an amazing, amazing woman, so it was sort of shocking. Soon thereafter, her sister, my mother, passed away Wednesday night, and the blessing. The biggest gift I was telling the choir, some of the choir friends was that I was able to be at her bedside, to hold her hand, and I sang, what a wonderful world. I don't know where that came from. It was just something I was like, I want to sing. And she was taken 
such good care of. She was in a coma at that point. It was really rapid. Um, she's had some health issues. And my brother Mark and I are <laughs> team elder care. <laughs> um, and so he was blessed to be with her during the day, said his goodbyes. We were going to put her in hospice the next day, and she passed at 10 p.m. Wednesday. Um, and I thank the choir for going with the flow and when I had to cancel choir rehearsal because it was such a gift. So prayers for Patricia Ferris, for Barbara Hoover. And now my mother's reunited with my dad, her great love, and my brother Rand. So thanks. Sorry it took so long. <laughs> The table of sharing is now open if you want to line up over by the side. My name is Anam. Um, just uh, a concern. Um, please keep uh, my uh, grandmother-in-law, my wife Chrissy's grandmother, um, in your thoughts. Um, she's deteriorating. Uh, her health is deteriorating rapidly. And um, my wife went to see her a couple days ago. And um, her son, uh, one of her sons, is in from town. And, um, and she's starting to give away some of her most, you know, prized and beloved possessions and it just feels like um, she's just sort of preparing to to leave us and uh, so please please hold uh, Ellen Erickson uh, in your thoughts and meditations thanks hear me? Well, one of the worst things, the worst thing of getting older is when you lose people. Um, about three weeks ago, I got a, a text from an old friend who I knew as part of a larger group in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I went to school in the late 70s, saying that her husband, Nadim, had died. He was Pakistani, and we were a collection of Americans and Pakistanis and Persians. Uh, about 20, but there was like a nucleus of seven, of which he was one, and his wife, Roseanne Cole. So they had the, I was shocked. Um, you know, I had reconnected with them a couple of years ago because it turned out that they had sent me something about Trump that before I never knew them to be political at all, you know, but it was, kind of, well, it was good, I guess. But uh, So we reconnected. And then, so I attended the, I, uh, you know, tuned into the, um, service and I said to myself well oh okay I'm going to call Pam the other one of the other friends Pam Newman um, that was part of the group and didn't have her number and I called and her obituary came up she had died a few months ago I, I didn't know we had lost touch and it just kind of hit me I mean um, I didn't even want to believe it I, I looked away and all I saw was her, her name and the dates, and I, I thought, honest, this is stupid, I know, but I thought, wait a minute, no, no. Her name was in the paper because she was being honored for something. She was a longtime peace advocate as well as other things. But, you know, I, there was a denial, but no, she had died. And um, 
And then I found out also earlier this year, another person, um, June Inoue, I put three stones in, um, was part of our group. She was from Hawaii, the youngest, and she passed too. So I mean, I, I don't even know what to say. I have no place to put, no compartment to put this in, but it's just, I just wanted to say their names, Nadim Alam, Pam Newman, and June Inoue. Thank you. Hello, my name is Annie, and I'd like to send out prayers to Suzanne Weltman. And I have a thank you to give you for my brother. Last year, every week I stood up here and talked about him having a hemorrhagic stroke. Well, he's back at about 90%. And they put a stent in his brain to help with the leak. So he's doing beautifully. So thank you for all your prayers. Good morning. Wayne Boyd's my name, and I have a joy. I spoke to my daughter the other day, and if you don't know, she's living off, totally off the grid upstate New York. And she, uh, when I speak to her, I spoke to her the other day, and she, I, she purchased another cabin, but she's doing everything, insulating everything herself, cutting the windows herself. And she, I asked, I said, would you want me to come up? Oh, no, Daddy, I, I don't need any help. I'll do it myself. And she tells me, she says, and I call her again. I said, oh, you sure you don't need any help? She says, slow down, Daddy. This is because upstate, we live upstate in New York. I had a farm up there years ago, and we lived up there. And she took a 180 on me because she was living in Center City for 14 years. And all of a sudden, she tells me, I'm moving upstate New York. I said, upstate New York? I said, you... From the, from the center city to upstate New York, <laughs> what, what a switch, you know. But anyway, I, I could see where she got it from because I had, we had to farm up there. She, we lived up there for quite a few years. So uh, she's telling me to just slow that, slow your roll, Daddy. Just, you know, uh, don't rush me. I, on my own time, I'll get it done. But anyway, uh, last night I had the joy of seeing a good friend of mine that I've known for many years. Uh, when, before she was even no, known as uh, Patty LaBelle, was Patty LaBelle and the Bluebells back in the day. So that, that was an, an enjoyable experience. Good morning, I'm Jill. Um, I have to remark about, <clears throat> um, for me, the most beloved um, person in uh, the jazz uh, community in Philadelphia, Tim Steyer had mentioned uh, a few weeks ago that Larry McKenna, um, amazing tenor player, had passed. And there was, <clears throat> so sorry, there was a, a funeral mass for him um, a few days ago. And um, it was just such a, it's a joy and a sorrow because the um, the number of people who came out, there's so many musicians there, people that were uh, grade school uh, chums of Larry's, and uh, he was such a, a wonderful man. He, he was a consummate musician. He was so humble. He was so kind. Uh, we learned things that we had not known before about the, the tragedies that he had gone through in his in his life and he had never become bitter and the the, the most amazing thing of all and, and being a musician um, I just take so much comfort in this um, the amazing music that was that was uh, actually composed um, arrangements of um, Ave Maria and um, that were played instrumentally and Danny Boy and a singer Joanna Pascal who sang some other pieces so beautifully and and that just um, it just brought everything, you know, uh, the tears really, really fell then. So he was wonderful. If you didn't know about him, please look up his music uh, online. Just a wonderful man. And I used to call him and another musician who passed, Sonny Troy, the godfathers of uh, our Philadelphia musicians. And uh, he was wonderful, and he's going to be missed greatly.
I also have a sorrow that I'd like to share on behalf of Jane Zatz. Please keep Dr. Joe Price in your thoughts and prayers. He fell and has head trauma with other complications. Elizabeth Ann, would you please add stones for all those folks on line who have shared and for those joys and sorrows that remain in the sacred quietness of our hearts. I'm going to lift up a prayer. Spirit of life, eternal and gracious one, we lift up to you our joys and our sorrows. May we find comfort in this community that surrounds us and graces us with their love and care. We are grateful for the people who are part of our lives. Amen. And now Elizabeth Ann is going to tell a story, I believe. Yes. <laughs> oh, on the same page. Yay. I'm Elizabeth Ann Terry, your director of religious exploration. And I have a story about Hanukkah. Benny's first Hanukkah. Yay! By Jane Breslin Zablan. Zabban. Zalban. Come on, mouth, get it together. Next slide, please. The morning air was cold. Benny sank deeper under the quilt and curled his paws with excitement. At sunset, it would be the first night of Hanukkah. The first Hanukkah Benny would be old enough to remember. Next slide. After breakfast, Benny helped Mama peel potatoes for latkes. His sister Sarah made applesauce for the pancakes. The kitchen smelled of fresh cinnamon and lemon rind. Sarah spooned sour cream into Mama's best bowl, and Benny helped Papa fry jelly donuts. There may be jelly donuts downstairs. Hmm. Sugar powdered their noses. Next slide, Mike. The rest of the morning, Benny and Sarah searched for their Hanukkah presents, one for each of the eight nights. But they found nothing. Next slide. Light flakes of snow began to dust the trees. Benny and Sarah pressed their noses against the window panes, hoping they could play in the flurry. Mama said, dress warmly. Papa wrapped them in long woolen scarves. Next slide. Sarah tried to make snowballs, but they fell apart. Penny laughed. They look like mama's potato pancakes. And they pretended to eat them. <laughs> Let's visit Sasha and Christopher, Benny said. Sarah followed him down the hill, finding treasures along the way. And so did Benny. Next slide. When they got to their friend's house, Benny placed a special pine cone on the lower bough of Sasha and Christopher's tree. Sarah reached as high as she could and nestled some red winter berries 
in a branch above. They all made a star of twigs and put it on the top of the tree. The pink and orange sky glowed on a mound of snow. Benny and Sarah returned home, inviting Sa Sasha and Christopher to their house. Next slide. When nighttime came, the whole family arrived. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins. Benny emptied a box of colored candles. Benny chose his favorite color, yellow and green for the shamas. Papa picked up Benny in his arms and held the bright green candle. Benny repeated the prayer after Papa. Mama smiled proudly. Next slide. The light from the menorah warmed the frosted sill outside. Benny and Sarah taught Sasha and Christopher how to spin the dreidel. Everybody sang songs. Then it was time for gifts. Sarah got hers first. Then she helped her little brother and cousins unwrap their presents. Benny got just what he always wanted. Sasha and Christopher each untied a bag of chocolate gold coins. Everyone sat around the fire. Grandpa told the story of Hanukkah about how the oil burned magically for eight nights. Benny pretended to be a Maccabee warrior. <laughs> As the first night of Hanukkah came to an end, Sasha and Christopher said, it was wonderful. Benny asked his parents, could they come the second night, too? Mama and Papa nodded yes. At bedtime, Benny's parents kissed him goodnight and said, Happy Hanukkah! Benny held his new stuffed bear a little tighter and said, This was my best Hanukkah ever. Sarah tiptoed in. Mama and Papa hugged Benny and whispered, it was ours too. The end. Just going to do a quick shout out to see if there's anybody who would like to go and do religious exploration or you're more than welcome to stay here with us. Okay. Our first reading for adults are excerpts from Eight Tales for Eight Nights. Hanukkah is a Time for Telling Tales by Professor Schramm. On the first night of Hanukkah, my father would proudly and carefully take his menorah from the break front, place it on the table, and set the first candle in the right hand holder. After my parents and I recited the blessings and lit the first candle, my father would then set the, would then set the lit shamash in its special holder, higher than the other holders. When I got old enough to observe the details, I realized that the larger candle was of a different shape and design than the rest of the holders. Rather than a squat cup, it was oblong in a shape and it swung from side to side with a crooked S-shaped wire. One year I asked, Pa, why is the Shamas holder so different from the other candle holders? My father laughed and responded, well, the original cup had broken off years ago, 
and I replaced it with an empty bullet shell. <laughs> then I used a curtain hook to attach it to the menorah. I accepted that explanation and thought how ingenious my father was. I loved that menorah and always watched the candles until they flickered out. My father had brought it with him when, we, when he came to America from Lithuania at the turn of the century in 1906. At the time of these memories, the menorah was probably a half century old. While we would watch the candles dance, my father always told me of the story of Hanukkah. And when all the candles had gone out, we would then go to the synagogue where my father was a Hazan to celebrate the holiday with the congregation. The women of the ladies auxiliary of the shul were always busy frying hundreds of latkes in the big kitchen and serving them to the families sitting at long tables. There was some kind of entertainment by the children of the Talmud Torah as well as my father singing cantorial and Yiddish songs in honor of Hanukkah. But what I waited for each year was when a man by the name of Mr. Harry Gordon would take his seat behind a certain small table with shiny pennies piled up in front of him. The children all lined up in front of the table. He would greet each child by name and ask, how old are you this year? And then he would give each of us Hanukkah gelt, according to our age. Five years old, five pennies. 10 years old, 10 pennies, and so on. I treasure that gift as I treasure that memory. One Hanukkah, when I was at college, I wondered about the substitute shamas. After lighting candles with my parents, I suddenly said, Pa, it's absolutely perfect that this bullet casing be on a menorah. After all, when the Maccabees found the temple desecrated and the menorah destroyed, they used spears to hold the cruises of oil so they could rededicate the temple. Doesn't it say in Isaiah that peace will come when we beat our swords into plowshares? Maybe we should add, and our bullets into menorahs. <laughs> I now have inherited this menorah the menorah I love, so filled with memories and lights. And when I light the shamas each year for the eight nights of Hanukkah, it's also the shamas holder that holds a special meaning to me. This is the story my children grew up hearing from me, and it is part of our family lore and their legacy. We invite you to stand up, and rise in body and spirit as you feel called to sing the hymn, Kindle Candles, One by One.
Mm. Our second reading, excerpts from the Maccabees and Me, How I Learned to Love Hanukkah, is by Rachel Tingley. Hanukkah, in a way, was one of my first words. The Jewish Festival of Lights began at the start of December of 1991, and my parents lovingly explained everything they were doing to light the candles. I was delighted. I pointed to it and said, Haka, and then associated, associated all other lights with it for a while, particularly candles. This was an anecdote so beloved by my family that it is repeated every year, usually after we have lit the candles together for the first night. I didn't know it yet at 20 months old, but thus began my lifelong obsession with Hanukkah. It's a holiday that, as an adult, I have mixed feelings about. It celebrates light in the darkness, hope where there is none, and the triumph of the underdog. At the same time, it celebrates war, bloodshed, and the winning of fundamentalism over modernism. Things were a lot easier when I only associated Hakka with my family and candles. Nevertheless, my interest in this holiday remains. Hanukkah celebrates the winning of the Jewish people over the Greek Seleucid Empire in the second century BCE, but it also celebrates the major underdog story of the Maccabean Revolt. The Maccabees were fundamentalist Jews who hated the Hellenistic influence of the Greek Empire on Jewish life. In the end, the Maccabees declared independence, but the battle to get there was long, hard, and had a deep effect on the way Judaism was practiced then and now. Originally, the Greeks hadn't had any problem with how the Jews practiced their religion. However, after a high priest of Jerusalem led a revolt, the Greeks seemed to have assumed it was all of Judaism that was a problem and cracked down on open Jewish worship from that point out. The Maccabees, who had always hated Greek rule, revolted not only against them, but also the Hellenized Jews, the Hellenized Jews, and everything they stood for, a Judaism that made room for assimilation. The Maccabees ended up winning that revolt, and the story we've all heard about the origins of Hanukkah, the miracle of the eight nights that the oil lasted, is their story. The way that they practiced Judaism won out over the Hellenized, assimilated version. This means that the Judaism that we practice now has been highly influenced over the years by this example of an intra-religious dialogue. As a Reformed Jew, the daughter of a Jewish mother, and a father who did not convert to Judaism until after I was born, I am exactly the kind of person by which the Maccabee, Maccabees would have been horrified about living in their ranks. I don't think they would have had any idea what to do with me. Personally, the sort of Judaism I participate in is closer to the Seleucid Greek Judaism than the Maccabean Judaism. Does this holiday celebrating the Maccabees victory hold meaning for me? I believe it does, albeit perhaps not in the way the Maccabees intended. Hanukkah is a time to spend time with other Jews in a season where much of North America seems entirely focused on Christmas. Although Hanukkah is not a major festival, it has become larger in American Jewish life due to its ability to hold Jewish space in the holiday season. It's a time of year where I am completely happy to say, actually, I celebrate Hanukkah and spend the time with my loving family. Although I am an assimilated Jew, I nonetheless strongly identify as a Jew, even though there is a larger culture of a different religion. And in that way, I am more like the Maccabees than not. I will continue to light Hakka candles with my family and celebrate their warmth and love every year, 
and I believe it will reinforce my Jewish identity in the years to come. As I shared in Thursday's e-newsletter, my heart and mind have become so quiet this week. I described it as feeling as if love and spirit had asked me to pause, to be present to the sorrows and concerns unfolding around me, and to hear what is being carried on the wind. To be so humbly quiet that I can be as present as possible to all that is being held in a moment. At first, I thought I was shutting down, disconnecting myself from my feelings and emotional life, placing a barrier between myself and others. But that's not what's been happening. Instead, this quietness has invited lamentation with others, both near and far, into my soul. It has asked me to move through the world with vulnerability and wholeheartedness. But when I first started entering this space of quietness and stillness, I judged it. I thought I should be in a different heart space during this year's Festival of Lights. After all, each night that one remembers the story of Hanukkah, each night that the ritual of lighting a candle is embodied, we know that the miracle will occur. We know that the candles will flicker brightly, illuminating the world directly surrounding us. We have become so accustomed to the miracle that sometimes we live the end of the story before it has arrived. But what if we came from a place of uncertainty, of wondering? What if we breathed into the mystery as our ancestors did so long ago? What if, when we gathered with friends and family, we lived into the mystery unfolding? the miracle occurring, will the oil last another night? Could this deepen the story for us even more, make us see new connections as Professor, Professor Sham did, discover new ways the story has meaning for us as it did for Rachel Tingley? Could it transform how we are able to see miracles happening around us today? I often wonder if we don't see or experience miracles because we assume that how events unfold is the way they were to be, or that it was luck, or that mystery miracles are to be of a certain degree, that something might seem too small to be a miracle or not to be a miracle at all. Perhaps our world is so fast-paced that we cannot feel mystery or miracle tingling within us anymore. So what if we paused in the quiet and stillness and experienced moments as they unfolded, leaving ourselves open to being present with others? What mystery or miracle might unfold for us? And if we can connect to those smaller miracles, might we become more aware of the events moving us towards the larger ones? So I'm going to share one, what I call a miracle, short story with you. On November 26th, after a long day, an intern minister was driving home. She had traveled about 30 minutes to one de destination, five minutes to another, and 45 minutes to the next. She stopped to get some food. And when she got to the top of the hill, approximately two miles away from her house, her car stopped. And it never started again. So she frantically called her brother because he's wise. He's a guy. He'll know what to do. And he calmed her down, and she called the insurance company. And as she was on the phone with the insurance company, somebody knocked on her window. Now, the 26th, that Sunday, it was raining cats and dogs, and it was coldish. Somebody's knocking. She puts down the window, and he goes, do you need help? 
I can push your car around. Do you want me to push your car around? And she's confused because she's on the phone talking with somebody, trying to get a tow, and somebody's being so kind, and she hears a voice come into her head going, he's a stranger, don't take his help. And then another voice that said, it's raining, why would he want to help you if he didn't really want to help you? So he pushed her car around the corner onto Rosedale. And she sat there for a while waiting for the tow. And suddenly, a big white truck, with a four-door truck, pulled up beside her. And he rolled down his passenger window and he said, hi, I just wanted to make sure that you're OK. I'm delivering pizzas, and I just delivered two pizzas at different places and saw that you're still sitting here. So I just wanted to make sure that you're OK. I said, I'm OK, she said, I'm OK. And he's like, OK, I'm from <laughs> Primavera Pizza. <laughs> See you later. And then the tow truck comes. And it's a mess, because it's raining, and the car has been pushed into large puddles. So the gentleman with the tow truck gets soaked. And he asks her a question, and she thinks, he's asked me, how am I going to get to the garage? And she says, I'm going to walk. And he goes, you're going to what? And she says, I'm going to walk. He's like, where are you going to walk? And I'm like, down the street and around the corner. He's like, why don't you get in the truck? Now she knows, usually, tow drivers, they don't take you in their trucks any longer. They go, you gotta find your ride. And then once the car was there, he said, how are you getting home? Where do you live? And she told him, and he said, I'm taking you home, I know where that is. There were many miracles that night. I didn't think so at the time. I knew the kindnesses were there. And then I thought about where the car had stopped. I had said to myself, don't take 422 tonight. Drive the longer way. Just don't deal with it. And I stopped at Wawa, and I got to the top of the hill, and I'm at the stop sign, and there she went. Two miles from my home. She had gotten me two miles from my home. And to me, of all the places where she could have stopped, that was a miracle. I was safe. I wasn't going to get hit by somebody else. And so I am forever grateful to Booberry. I had her for nine years. She had 209,000 miles on her. And my brother was like, that's a lot for a four-cylinder car that's driven to and from Tennessee many times. Many times. So I wonder what would happen if we slowed down, stepped into the quiet and stillness. What we might hear, what we might experience. Nobody said, what political party are you from? Nobody said, how do you identify? Nobody worried about anything like that. There was just kindness. And I'd like to end this little talk with words by Rabbi, I'm totally going to mispronounce this, Yael, who reminded everybody Thursday night that Hanukkah encourages us to search for and lift up light even when so much lies in ruin. Hanukkah calls to us to cultivate active hope, the willingness to act in times of great turmoil, and be nourished by each other's devotion and care. Hanukkah calls us to remember that just because we cannot see how healing could come to our tumultuous and frightened world, this does not mean it won't happen. Hanukkah calls us beyond what we think we know to a place where the miraculous is possible. The mystics teach that the Hanukkah lights shine from the beginnings of creation, revealing the divine spirit in all. These lights are filled with pure love freely given. May the Hanukkah flames nourish our hearts and souls. May they shine with love, bringing moments of joy-filled possibility. And may these lights that come from the depths of mystery illuminate pathways of healing and peace. 
Blessed be and amen. Thanks, Shay. I completely identify with that story. <laughs> Not once or twice or three times. It's nice when you're in that position and it does reaffirm your faith in people. I mean, most, I believe firmly most people want, want to be good, they want to be kind. I mean, that's in spite of everything. Um, now's the time that we collect our offering of financial resources for the good of this community. Ushers, please go ahead and start the passing of the plates here in the sanctuary. We know that there are many ways to give back to this congregation, and we encourage you to find a way that works for you. For giving of financial support, your money or checks you can put in the plate, and they will be used to fund the ministries of this church. And any pocket change or other money um, that you designate for change for change online, or by putting, uh, or you can put it in the white envelopes in the pews, will be sent to this month's selected change for change organization, the Museum of Indian Culture. More information on this is on your screen about how to give. Please know know that if this is your first time with us, there is no expectation that you give anything other than a yellow contact form or letting us know how you found us and how we can support you. The offering will now be gratefully accepted. Also, hi, my name is Craig. If you're interested in the Change for Change organization, there's also a little write-up in your insert bulletin uh, just to learn more about the group we're going to be giving funds to. Um, the song we're about to sing, uh, Peace, Salam, Shalom, was written by Pat Humphreys and Sandy Opatow. have a group, a wonderful group called Emma's Revolution. You've got to look them up. They've got great music, very contemporary, but very, you know, progressive music. Um, Pat Humphreys wrote this song right after 9-11. Um, she was living, I think, in the New York area. And it, it's about peace and it's about reconciliation. But she wrote it in the spirit of uh, responding to the, the drums of war that, if you recall, 9-11 began as soon as the dust was beginning to clear. And she wrote this song and then it was, she, they first sung it at the first big national peace march trying to prevent and uh, urge the Bush administration to not go to war in Iraq as a, as a war of revenge. Um, and for me, that song really resonates to what's going on today in Gaza and Israel-Palestine. So. So this is a sing-along with the choir moment. <laughs> and the words are, peace, salam, shalom. That's it. <laughs> and it's a round. And I have the choir in two sections today so that they can encourage you to sing the round. So this side will start the round first. We're going to sing the whole song together. And then this side will start the row, row, row your boat, but peace, salam, shalom. <laughs> Different words. Um, <laughs> and just have, have fun. Don't, there's no such thing as perfection, but three words, peace, salam, shalom, they all mean the same thing. Salam Shalom, peace 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 Salam Shalom. Peace, salam, shalom. Peace, 
across the world. Peace, salam, shalom. for peace we will work for peace we will work for peace we will work for peace we can live in 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 peace. We believe in peace. We believe in peace. We believe in peace. We believe in peace. Peace, shalom, envision it. Where is it? Streets of Philadelphia, Gaza Strip, We're going to do a Reverend McKinley quick, quick, so. So, as we get ready to extinguish our chalice. As we get ready to extinguish our chalice and end our time together this morning, Please remember to stick around for coffee hour to chat with folks on Zoom. And for more info, you can check the weekly newsletter that comes out on Thursdays for worship schedules. And you can see our website for more important information. The words to extinguish our chalice are a blessing by Steve Garnis Holmes. Please extinguish your chalice at home and read the words that are shared to your screen or displayed behind me. Let us lean into these words together as we connect through time and space. Please join me. May the peace of deep belonging settle upon you, the abundance of life's goodness surround you. Beloved, the mystery envelops you, the wonder embraces you, the breath of life flows through you always. And before we do our closing hymn, I'm actually going to say thank you all for being here with us today. And I want to invite everybody downstairs for coffee and conversation because I believe it's a second Sunday potluck. Yeah. Yes, it is. So please join us for time together. Holly, will you please lead us in our closing hymn? And also hand bells at 12.30. Our closing hymn is 214, Shabbat Shalom. Please rise and sing as you are moved and able to do so either at home or here. And Sharon, let's get that tambourine out.
Thank you. 